first I would like to invite you to take part in this discussion so that we not just have a, a panel discussion but actually a pl plenary discussion together. I think we have all received a lot of input uh, already, of the, yesterday especially, <laughs> and, uh, and this morning. So now is an opportunity to actually address questions that may have also risen uh, in the, the pre presentations that we have heard so far and uh, that would be valuable to discuss um, uh, well, for the next hour or so. Um, we have already learned that um, the credibility and relevance of carbon footprint information is, is an um, important issue, but also that it um, poses some challenges for, for assurance and, and verification. Um, and at the same time being important for, to manage, uh, manage uh, risk also. Um, and I'm very happy to have, <coughs> um, well, several people here with me uh, on stage that uh, are uh, involved in, in quite interesting activities themselves around, um, well, carbon footprinting and also assurance of, of carbon footprint information and, and uh, related terms. Um, I will quickly say who is with me. We have uh, Cynthia Kamis, who um, manages the greenhouse gas protocol work now with the product and scope three standards. She will present later this afternoon. Yesterday we had a presentation by Holly Ladd already uh, on, on some of the work and uh, uh, well, we're very happy to have her with us here. We have Jonathan Hall from SGS. Uh, he is global head of the climate change program at SGS and uh, can uh, uh, provide an interesting insight from the assurance point of view in our uh, discussion. We have Roland Hichir from the EcoInvent uh, Center. Some of you have um, uh, well seen his, his presentation also uh, before and he was also taking uh, part in the previous discussions. He's their dep deputy manager of the EcoInvent Center and therefore uh, well, very close to the whole issue of, of data, data assurance and so on that is, is very important to take into account. We have Maita Villafane from DNV with us where he is climate change, uh, responsible for climate change and environmental services for Benelux UK and Germany. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Klaus Radunski, who uh, at very short notice stepped in for Moritz Nil from Price Waterhouse. Klaus Radunski uh, manages or convenes the ISO 14067 standard uh, carbon footprint of products that uh, will be released soon as well, and uh, will also be or is already very important for uh, well the carbon footprint standards development. So. Uh, please let us all welcome our, our speakers and, and participants here and, um, well, please. <laughs> um, as a very first uh, step, I would like to uh, ask uh, the panelists up here with me, um, how do we actually make carbon footprinting work in the future. We've all put a lot of efforts into developing standards and tools around carbon footprinting over the past years, some even uh, further with the, the LCA work that has been uh, done before. And we still have a, a strong challenge ahead of us, us in reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, over time. So uh, how do you think we'll make it work and actually who has to take responsible to make it work in the future? Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rasmus. Uh, uh, thank you for you coming here to uh, this interesting meeting. First of all, of course, there are those who are owners of supply chains who give the initiative to estimate the carbon footprint. And uh, this is an important step, but an estimation without verification is of little value, to be honest, because uh, the methodology is quite complex. Uh, we know that the existing uh, standards regulating life cycle assessment offered so much freedom that the figures simply are not comparable if you provide, if you don't provide further guidance. And uh, 
we try now to uh, provide this further guidance, but this guidance is still at a very generic level. It should uh, support quantification of carbon footprint of all products, including all goods and services. And clearly, uh, there is a lot of decisions have to be made uh, that are sometimes, and there is some guidance in the principles, in the decisions that you should start with natural science, move on to economic science, and then at the end there are also sometimes value judgments that have to be made. And uh, this is unavoidable, and therefore a verification and transparency are so important if you want to compare those figures and if you want to communicate it to the public. We struggle a lot in ISO with this because our intention is not only to provide a quantification tool but also a communication tool. And here clearly verification is very important. I will provide more information on that. And there are various verification approaches. But the success ultimately will uh, be determined how much trust can the public have in those figures. And therefore, the verifiers have a significant role. And we have to invest not only in calculation of carbon footprint, but also in verification. I leave it for the time with that. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Klaus Radunski, and uh, we'll continue with uh, Cynthia Kamis from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Okay. Can uh, people hear me in the back? Okay. So um, I see an, an, a number of clear needs that, um, for the marketplace in order for product carbon footprinting to be successful in the long run. Um, Overall, I think costs need to come down to complete a carbon footprint and cost of measurement, the cost of getting data and the cost of completing assurance. Um, right now, there is no consistent understanding of what assurance is and so I th there needs to be some standardization around assurance so that everyone has a common understanding of assurance and we're all clear about what type of assurance actually needs to be completed for a credible carbon footprint. Um, and there needs to be more technical capacity. In a lot of countries, there's nobody it even has the ability to do a, um, a high quality carbon inventory, a carbon footprint for a product. So there just needs to be a lot more training available and um, ability to um, more people able to complete a, um, product inventories. And then I just need more freely available data and high quality data, things that we all know about. And then to bring the cost down, there just need to be more tools to simplify measurement and, um, and, the, and the, have the best data built into these tools. It's going to be very hard for companies to, to expect companies to continually over time to hire consultants to do product inventories. Eventually, they're going to need to internalize this function if they're going to do it for many of their products on a regular basis. So um, there have to be just more tools to simplify the process for them. And then I kind of divide the marketplace into two sections. One is the marketplace for where um, comparison is being performed. And for comparison, you're going to need more PCRs. And to really reduce the burden for companies so they don't have to use different PCRs for different labeling systems, different countries they operate in, PCRs are going to need to be harmonized internationally to create the consistency necessary. And then I just, right now the common practice for reviewing product inventories has been critical review. And I think, I, I don't expect in the marketplace that that's going to hold up for product labeling systems and other types of comparisons. I think that process just um, isn't going to provide the institutionalization and the, the consistency and credibility needed. Um, but I do the other part of the marketplace is I think product inventories are still going to be very valuable for non-comparison purposes where um, companies just want to identify risks and opportunities in their value chain or they just want to be transparent about what their product inventories look like. And for those purposes, um, I don't think PCRs are necessary and I don't, um, critical review I think believe is a sufficient type of assurance process. So I, and the standards at, that we already have out there are going to be sufficient. So I think that piece of the marketplace will con continue to grow really quickly. Um, and that what's in place now can actually meet the needs of that piece of the market. Okay. 
Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. Um, Jonathan, what, what is your perspective? How do we make it all work? Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, however many times uh, you've told me what the question is going to be, it still goes blank as soon as you ask it. But, uh, okay, I mean, I want to steal actually something that I think it was Malcolm Fox said yesterday about volume, scale, and speed. Uh, I want to perhaps envisage a future where we're, we're knowing your carbon footprint is as common as knowing your components of your uh, materials, or sorry, components of your products, all the ingredients of them. And in that case, we've got to change fundamentally probably the way that we're doing this. And, and I agree very much about the cost coming down and the way that we respond to that. Uh, I wonder if that means that we'll be moving towards a more systems-oriented approach to this, where actually we're looking at the processes by which uh, companies are collecting data, gathering data, assessing data, looking at those, ensuring those, and then sampling products accordingly. I don't think where we are now is really going to be the blueprint for, for where we are in the future. You also asked whose responsibility is it. I think certification bodies in general have a, a strong responsibility to support development. But actually, it's not something we'd be very good at leading. We're, we're very good, I think, at responding to the specific requirements of specific clients and customers. But we're not geared up to run consensus-based development. Um, and I think we, could, we have a, a strong input to give to that and a responsibility to give to that. But uh, I think it's something we have to, to look to others probably to lead. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, Roland, uh, I think you have a particular perspective also on, on, on the developments and also the, the market needs. Um, from your perspective, what, what kind of future do you foresee in two, three years' time? How, where should this all, all develop to so that we really make it work and have it as a good tool for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions? I think a key issue is like some of the previous speakers already mentioned is uh, that we have an, an easy access to, to consistent, transparent and quality insured data in order that, that not everybody that tries to do this kind of calculation has to reinvent the wheel. So, uh, of course, what, 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 what we could uh, see is that, that EcoInvent could play a role in, 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 in this sense by, by offering a a database that on a global level can, can offer transparent, comprehensive information that then can also be used in, in, in different tools. So you have one database uh, that you can use for full LCA studies, but that, any, that you can use in the same time also for carbon footprint calculation, for material flow analysis and so on. And if, if all these different tools try to to make use of the same data, this I think will enhance the, the, the credibility because these tools then uh, put in advance the specific points that you can put in advance with the different tools, but at least they are based on the, on the same quality insured uh, uh, database behind. Okay, open accessible data and if possible same data used by everyone will, will very much help. Um, Maita, what is your, your perspective on where, where we, we should go and how we sh like who should actually take the leap forward? As you have already said, I think a lot of work has been done so far. And as a result, we see now we have a new standard launched. A new standards launch also uh, very soon. Um, product category rules, which is very important and I think key for the future. I think now it's time to provide credibility in what has been done and what will be done by the companies. So when a company will come with these product carbon footprint figures, it has to be trusted. I think it, had, it can be done through product category rules. We will come back, I guess, later about that. Um, but um, I think there are also possibilities to, to improve the assurance, the way the assurance is provided. Uh, we will discuss, I guess, also later about that. And my personal hope for the future is that we will see a decreasing number of standards because as we have seen also this morning in the presentation, uh, every slide, there are a lot of standards. Every new presentation, I see new standards. It's not the, the good way to, to, to manage this. But that's a personal hope. I'm not sure if we will achieve this. Okay, thank you very much. So 
Um, if you have questions, please raise. I will uh, then, uh, or you can then ask them directly to the uh, uh, participants here. Raise your hand. Um, we've heard that um, verification is probably necessary. That it is that it provides uh, value to to the the information that we have out there. Um, Jonathan, again, what is your your perspective on on the limits of of uh, assurance that actually can uh, be provided and what can be assured uh, and and what not maybe okay well I think it's it's tied up again with um, what actually are we going to be asked to be looking at you know as, as things become if we do go down the multi criteria approach the sh there is a limit to what any particular the cost the regulatory cost if you like that any particular product can bear and uh, we will have to find, as I say, um, more streamlined ways of reviewing that. So um, I suppose I am back to my point. Will we be looking more at the way in which the data is collected than 100% of the outputs? And actually just sampling outputs, expecting them, expecting the uh, companies themselves to have rigorous regimes for, for reviewing and assuring their own controls. And then we sample that on that kind of basis. So I think the limitations are purely what, what the market can bear. Okay, thank you. Uh, might I, you yes. have a perspective? I think I would like to come back very, very briefly on the fundamentals, on the fundamentals of uh, an assurance. So, because I'm not sure everybody knows this. Um, so, for the moment, there are two possibilities for um, level of assurance. You have the limited level of assurance and the reasonable level of assurance. Usually, we, uh, as verifier, uh, we ask to the client, what do you need as verification? So it's based on the needs of the, of the verified entity. If we go for a limited level of assurance or a reasonable level of assurance. If the company wants to have an external review on what they have done, uh, more trust on what they have done, and, and if they want to, to be able to, to public, to, 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 to give a, a, a statement on their uh, verification, that's, then it's a limited level of assurance. But if it is, for instance, for regulatory reason, or for uh, like in the, in the emission trading scheme, or if, if it is for the um, monetary reason for a B2B uh, contract agreement, then we go for a reasonable level of assurance. And my point here is that when I'm hearing what is happening here, uh, especially yesterday or last, uh, la last forum, we have two approach. We have people who say an LCA or a product carbon footprint should not be made for comparison or to compare products. It should be made just to understand more the process and to raise the red flags and to improve the process. But I think the level of assurance and the deepness of the verification will depend on the approach. Because uh, what I'm hearing here, more and more the product carbon footprint will become a, a ticket to trade. That means we put on a, la on a label, my product emits six kilograms of CO2. And you want, or these companies, or the label wants that the customer it is raising customer awareness, and that the customer then decides, oh, I will choose for this product, product because it's four kilograms. If it is the ultimate goal, then I would say verification is very necessary in a reasonable level of assurance. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Klaus, please. You know, I, I'm also responsible for the national inventory for Austria, and I'm engaged in the review process of national inventories. And uh, there, we have uh, a regular review process. And I must say, thanks to this review process, the quality of the inventories have significantly increased. And the tools that the review teams uh, have available uh, can become more sophisticated if more data become available. So if we get a database, for instance, of carbon footprints of products, and if there's a disaggregation, for instance, in the significant stages of every life cycle, uh, there is, it becomes much easier to identify uh, what seem to be unreasonable figures. And then uh, the direction for the review process for the verifier uh, is much faster and we can um, have a much easier assurance. I also fully agree uh, what has been said that with emissions trading, this is probably the highest level of assurance 
needed. And due to that, you must imagine that those uh, regulators of emission trading schemes, they limit those processes that can be eligible for emissions trading to those that can be estimated at reasonable low uncertainty. Uh, so if the uncertainty of emissions, for instance, in land use change and forestry are much higher, an order of magnitude or even higher than with emissions associated with energy uh, sector, then you cannot put this together uh, without problems in the same emissions trading scheme. Uh, because the quality differs of those emissions significantly. And uh, I, I feel that those processes that are linked to emission trading sectors, and if they are covered by those sectors, they will have a very good quality, and the people who prepare uh, those inventories and the verifiers, they should be in a position to make use of uh, cross-checks with those data. They need to have access to those data. That would facilitate the process significantly. Uh, I leave it now with that. Okay, thank you very much. I, what I, I, I sense that uh, we, we still have a, a certain uh, conflict around the, 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 what actually we would like to provide to the public. There's a, a need or a drive to actually provide very concrete figures, be it for comparison or for, for other interpretation by, by the public, and the limits that, w that we uh, face there in terms of what can actually be uh, assured. So um, how, how can we, we, we solve that? Um, I mean, what, is there, what further work is maybe needed or like what pragmatic uh, steps need to be taken to, to come to, to uh, well, grip on, on, on really provide, or what kind of information actually can be provided that will then help to drive emissions that at the same time can be assured. I think we still have a, an unclear picture of, of that uh, world that we see there, actually. Cynthia, you're nodding, so we yeah, have yeah, perspective. Sure I know the answer to that, but I do envision that um, for the topic of assurance that there's going to need to be like a tiered solution and the type of assurance process that's appropriate. The, um, the type of inventory that you're completing and the purpose that you're using it for needs to be matched with an appropriate type of assurance. Um, there's many levels of assurance. Um, there's you know, what uh, hopefully was, I think was discussed yesterday, but data assurance or model assurance where you're just assuring that the assumptions of the model um, and, the, um, and the assumptions in the inventory are reasonable versus data assurance. I think there's those different approaches will be appropriate for different uses of a report and also um, limited versus reasonable assurance. Well, um, what you need is gonna depend on what you're using the information for. And so I'm, I see with corporate, in, corporate inventory market is that verification has been a huge barrier for companies to do inventories and put it out in the public space because if, if we're, verification is required, it's so costly that it keeps companies from doing it. So, um, so I think we just have to figure out an approach that um, that won't prevent companies from wanting to participate in a program or labeling system um, because it just costs too much to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the cost issue that uh, uh, Cynthia addresses, I think that, that this is one of the, the, the main limits also to taking it up. Um, I would actually like to, to open up another the field of thinking about it. We have a, uh, a strong drive for uh, also transparency in the market. Uh, and transparency can be on, on the certain elements of, for example, carbon or environmental footprint information, but it can also be on, on other characteristics of, of the product systems that we look at and also the production methods maybe. So how is your or what is your perspective on, 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 the, on transparency in this regard? With more transparency on the processes behind, is there less need for costly assurance or, uh, or vice versa? Is it, uh, does, do we need more assurance when, when there's more transparency in the market? How do you see these two issues relating, uh, drive for transparency and the, the need for, for assurance? Um, okay. Maita, please, yeah. Um, and I please also uh, engage in the discussion. Just to come back very briefly on the cost issue. I, I know that uh, verification can be seen as costly. Though I think we have to look also to the full picture. 
when you start to think about a product carbon footprint, and the end is you publish your product carbon footprint figures. Verification, it is this in the process. So I'm not sure if you compare the costs of creation, of consulting, of production of your product, of your product carbon footprint with the verification costs. Well, of course, it depends on the sector, I guess. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure the verification cost is the, is the most costly. But just to, to come back on this point. Now about transparency, I think transparency is key, uh, especially between the verified entity and the verifier. Of course, very, uh, transparency is very good also for, for the public awareness, uh, but it's not all because, okay, you can have transparent data, but then you have to, to verify if the data that has been put are correct. I mean, it's like for a co customer, um, corporate social responsibility report. A company is providing his report, her rep its report, its transparency, but then this report has to be verified to guarantee that what is in the report is correct. So to me, transparency can help, of course, but it's not sufficient if you want to come with a sufficient level of assurance, I would say. So you, transparency and assurance go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Klaus, please. I, I want to add something with regard to the costs. Uh, from my experience, the costs of verification are the same whether you uh, have to review the inventory of a supply chain that has a small capacity or if you have a supply chain that has a large capacity. And that's, I feel, the big issue, so that you have a good relationship between the capacity and the, uh, you know, uh, of a supply chain and how much uh, revenue it creates and uh, in relationship to the verification. And I feel we probably need to be a little bit innovative in order to create supply chains that are worth being uh, studied and worth being verified. And of course, it's a little bit an issue for the very small producer, very small short supply chains where clearly the system does not really work. And I feel we need to be innovative how to combine many such small but very similar uh, producers into one virtual uh, chain which can be estimated and also verified. And I feel with that, because I was asked at one earlier PCF forum, by when do we expect to see carbon footprint for all products? And uh, I was rather optimistic, as was Matthias Finkbeiner on that. And in order that we can achieve that, that there is a full coverage. So you have, for all products, you know the cost because you have to pay for that. And you should also know the carbon footprint. It should go hand in hand. And uh, that's the vision. And in order to achieve that, I feel we need to be a little bit innovative and combine many small supply chains that are very similar into a virtual supply chain that is uh, monitored, reported, and verified. Can you quickly say virtual supply chain? What do we have to imagine there? Just you know, that you have to collect data, you have to define what should be combined, what can be combined, and who is in this boundary, and they should report uh, some in, um, information, and it's you know, it's in CDM, we have the programmatic approach, for instance. It's very similar to that uh, idea. So uh, you need to combine similar activities into one uh, large activity, which uh, will be described with the help of such tools. Maureen, please, yes. Do we have a microphone for Maureen? There's one coming. Yeah. Maureen Novak from DEFRA. And also, like, what, what is your take on what kind of assurance actually is, is needed? Maybe you can also feed that in. Maybe you have also feeling, I mean, we're all also consumers and at uh, one point or the other. Like, what, where do we actually need to get to so that, uh, that it, it all works? Maureen, please. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that Cynthia said, which I think is very true. It actually depends on what you're actually assuring and why. So in the why part, you need to be looking at who your audience is for this. Um, at one point, Erasmus, you 
seem to imply that we were talking about uh, communicating here with consumers, but in terms of carbon footprinting information, which is what the uh, heading is up behind you, um, that could be communicated not just to consumers, but it could be communicated, you know, business to business, for example. So I think it is important to establish what you're uh, assuring and why you're, uh, why you're doing it. Um, I just see carbon footprint information as the same as any other information. When you're communicating it, if you're communicating it to the public and the public is going to act in some way, or even if business is going to act some way on what you've communicated, the same caveats would apply to any other information you're communicating. So that if you're, you're giving your carbon footprint, um, the people you're giving it to need to have credibility in that. And the one way they will get credibility is by having confidence that in some way you are able to justify that. You will then need to justify it however you think best. So if there's a, a verification body out there that verifies the way you've done the footprint, um, if you've done it according to a standard, I don't think the verification needs to extend to verifying the actual number. I think the thing would be that you have actually carried out the process according to a prescribed standard, and had you done so, then it goes without saying that you have to accept the number that you come out with at the end of the day, because you're actually verifying you've, you've applied best practice and, and come up with that standard. So I, the point I made yesterday, it, Quantification is one thing, and the, and the footprint information is just, as I said, any other information you're communicating, and the same rules, I think, very much apply in terms of verification. If you've got a label, you, you have to um, make sure that it applies by the criteria which enables you. That is verification. The mere fact you put a label on is verifying that that product, in some way, has actually met the criteria which allows you to wear that label. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Uh, Jonathan, you yeah, quick I response. Think there's a, a point here that sort of links with back to was something that uh, my colleague from uh, so it's Meta, yeah, sorry, uh, made about um, the, the multiplicity of standards. Because actually, when we, if, you, if you're talking about these things, if it is going out into to the wide world, people have got to understand what that's about. And if they're facing a different thing from so many different sources, that's, that's not helpful. And I think we, sometimes, we should be filtering this through the sort of almost a step back, which is, is what we're doing, helping to drive changes in behavior. And I think we forget that sometimes. The, it's almost becoming a, a thing for itself, whereas actually the goal of this is, is that change. Um, there was something else, <clears throat> but, uh, but carry on. Okay. Um, uh, Maureen just mentioned um, that standards are very important as a basis. Um, that I mean, we have standards in, in, in many areas that... Uh, are then taking as the basis and information that is actually derived from these standards. It's most important to, to assure at least that the standards are applied correctly. So uh, we have carbon footprint standards out there. We have also certain uh, labeling standards maybe in certain areas, but uh, like global carbon footprint standards now. And I at least question or wonder myself, what, where do we actually head to? Is it that we, when we have these global standards, then actually the market will take care of, of the rest afterwards? Or will we need like additional uh, regimes that, uh, for example, accredit uh, assurance providers and say, okay, yes, for, for uh, certain kinds of, uh, of implementation issues, we need to have a more, more regulated uh, uh, framework that actually makes this work. Uh, Maita, yes, please. Yes, I think it's a good point, and I think that's uh, where, where I want to, to, to jump into is with the product category rule, because we, we talk a lot about harmonization in the verification process. Uh, product category rule could really uh, help if per product category rule you have some requirements with respect also to verification, because I think it will be the verification can be different if you are looking to uh, landfill uh, or to um, a forestry project than an industrial project or an IT project, like the description we had yesterday with the HP uh, uh, way of calculating the product carbon footprint. So I think, on one hand, Maureen was going to uh, the more the quality verification according to a standard. If at the end we compare figures, for me, it's more the quantity uh, uh, check and verification. And to, to compare figures and quantity, we need to have uh, more help from the standard with a, a, a standardized uh, methodology how to calculate the figures per product category rules. I think that would help. If we are sure that all the companies from a, uh, from a single uh, product category rule are using the same methodology 
to calculate the polluting carbon footprint, then the verification very, will be very smooth. It will be very direct. Because what is happening for the moment, every company is using a different methodology. And then that's, that what, that's what is made difficult for a verification body to, to check the figures. Okay, we have uh, Roland, uh, please. Uh, and Cynthia, you also yeah. would like to say something. And then we have a question in the back. And uh, please also always say uh, who, who you are. Uh, yes, please, Roland. Um, good keyword, the product category rules. I think they are important. However, um, what, what we can observe at the moment in, in, in different areas is that, that groups that are working on, on these kind of product category rules, they have tendency to, to go very far into detail, very far back in the chain in order to say there we have to use this and this allocation scheme and this and this has to be like this and so on. And I think this is in the same time also a danger because the more you go back the more difficulties you will have in the end to find in, in, in default uh, databases the information in the right way. I think when you define product category rules, try to define in the product category rules just what you need for the foreground system and, and, and for the background system, keep this as far as possible out of the product category rules because the databases, the different, not only equivalent, but also other databases that are available, they try to be consistent within the database. And, and so for the background system, the less rules you put into the product category rules, the better you can use these already consistent databases there. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. We need PCRs to actually um, Make, make the standards work and have that as a framework. At the same time, there's a, a risk to it that it uh, undermines some of the integrity of the, the, the data that we actually need to, to uh, these footprint calculations. Cynthia, please. And then we have Sylvain, I think, from the French Ministry. Um, so I, I see for the issue with PCRs is, um, is, is more about the fact that there's, they're, they're proliferating in many places, but they're not all based on a consistent standard. I see that now that there's the methodology behind carbon footprinting is becoming, the standardization on the general framework is becoming more consistent as the, the framework's moving together. If the PCRs were all, um, consist, all based off the same methodology, that would create more the consistency that's needed. And where I'm most concerned in the marketplace is where all these um, certification systems or performance standards are being um, developed, where you're seeing these are the labels that are all over the place, um, that they're all ba not based on a consistent methodology, they're not based on the same PCRs, and there's just so many of them. I think that's what creates the main confusion in the marketplace, and that's where I hope they'll be... Um, that there'll be clear winners in the marketplace over time and only a few international labels will win out that are multi-criteria um, and that will create a more um, consistent, credible, uh, understandable message to consumers. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, uh, Sylvain, please. Yes, Sylvain Chabassu from the French uh, Sustainable uh, Development Ministry. Uh, I agree with uh, Jonathan Hall that we shouldn't lose sight of the main objective, which is to change behavior and to moving towards um, lower carbon and greener consumption. And if we impose uh, verification on all uh, environmental and carbon footprints uh, to be communicated to the consumers, uh, then um, this communication will uh, remain limited to some niche products and we won't uh, achieve uh, this um, orientation of consumers towards uh, greener products, which is uh, our goal. Uh, and uh, we, we, we think that there are other ways to improve uh, assurance uh, in the system. Uh, for, I, I explained the, the French um, approach uh, yesterday, uh, not, notably through uh, uh, critically reviewed, uh, discussed and uh, adopted uh, methodologies and tools uh, through very open and participative uh, process. And, uh, uh, in, in the end, uh, users concerning the, the French system will all refer and use um, official um, 
these official methodology, methodologies, PCRs, tools, and, and, and calculators, and which provides, to our view, quite a, a strong basis uh, for uh, assurance and, um, and, and, and credibility. Uh, for, for, for the parts uh, concerning the, um, the specific data in the, in the footprints, then the verification should be um, recommended and, and encouraged, uh, but not, not made uh, obligatory. Yeah, we shouldn't uh, lose sight of consumer behavior and especially the practicality in Im implementing uh, the standards. Any thoughts on that? If I can, you did ask something around sort of the um, accreditation orientation. And uh, that to me is a very interesting area because actually it's not just a multiplicity of standards that we face. We face a multiplicity of accreditations. And you know, as, a, as an organization, we, we value accreditation. We can't, we, well, we can function without accreditation, but actually we, we like functioning within an accredited environment. Um, but you know, there exists the, the nationally recognized accreditation structures, and I find it odd, frankly, that in, in some of these areas, in the social area, in the environmental area, it's so often it moves out of that. Um, and I'm not sure that that's, that's very productive. It adds to, the, if we're talking about the cost of the, the companies on the ground, that's a significant factor. Can you name an example of accreditation structures that are in place that would actually help us in Working with the well, we work with the national accredited structures I'd like UCAS, and I guess you, do you represent that? No, you don't. But uh, <laughs> the presumably is an Australian, Australian equivalent. But you're talking about the AFNORs and the UCAS and the ANSIs. You know, they, they exist. There's mutual recognition of those. Mm -hmm. They have the structures. Uh, we've done the pilot for past 2050 through UCAS, and I think you know that that was a, a pretty successful process. So and we're doing other work with them on, say, a woodland carbon code. Uh, for some reason, these national accreditation bodies don't seem to always be the first port of call for the people that are setting standards in this field. And as I say, it adds significantly to cost. I've spent much more time in my career on the um, social side of the business, social auditing side of the business. There we face, I just, is this <laughs> the word again, proliferation, but, but it's, it means you have to go through so many processes to approve auditors doing exactly the same type of work. The people on the ground are then having to pay for that somehow. Uh, Ahmed. Okay. Yeah, hello, I'm Ahmed from SGS. Um, I think um, the, the point which we are discussing here is uh, what is future vision in terms of credibility? Um, especially, I mean, when we have the constraint of the cost. But let's say, assuming or hoping that tomorrow, will be having product carbon footprint as a mass market. This is what I think we are all expecting. Once this becomes as a mass market, then I think we need to really think about what would be the, let's say, the, the scenario of doing the assurance. And in that case, I think keeping the cost as a constraint, I would rather suggest that we need to think about a certain automatic system within the assessment process, which really lead to have a certain level of assurance while doing the assessment. And then I think we still need to have a certain credibility, which you were mentioning about. In that case, I think we need to have a certain sampling system. Not, not really as a random system, but we need to have a certain sampling system because we cannot cover up millions of products you know, in the next two, three years. So we need to have really have a certain self-assurance system within the system of the measurement. And then finally, giving a sort of a certain sampling system which really provides uh, a certain degree of the credibility. That's uh, the, the point. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Maureen, you had to, oh, yes, please, might I be the Just like to, to say I fully agree with you, and I think it's, jo it's joining also what Sylvain was saying just before. If you are looking to the French example, what do they have? They have a database that is accepted by everybody and used by all the companies. They have methodologies that have been approved by product category rules, by industries, and by uh, academics, and by public people. So that means, if you have this kind of structure, of course, verification is less important, and you can start to do sampling. But if you don't have this, you still need to have verification on a more regular basis. So there's a, there is, an, or there's, let's say, room for, for yes. structures still to be, be established that will actually 
uh, facilitate uh, assurance like on a larger scale let's say if yeah. we have this at the at a global if we have this as, at the global level of course we can do that you would like to okay, then uh, Maureen, please. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I agree with that, and I think that the, the crucial point you just made is the fact that there is a structure, there is already a framework, which picks up exactly the point Cynthia was making, that if you have the structure there, you have the, a standard and something coming out of it, it's the same principle. Once you've got a structure there against which, which, which sets the, the rules, as it were, for the behavior that you have to go through in order to be able to to claim a footprint or have some footprint information. Once you've got that, um, half the battle's over, I think. But I, uh, the point I wanted to pick up from Silva, we're not talking about imposing verification here. Um, and I, the, the point was made about, um, uh, that Jonathan made about it, people don't realize sometimes that this applies to environmental information. Well, I think the Commission realized that not so long ago because they saw fit under the Unfair Commercial Practices Act to remind member states that it did actually also apply to environmental information. So I go back to my thing, it's information that you're communicating and how you verify that. Any, anything you do uh, as a company, if you're claiming something and you say, this is my footprint, you need to, someone at some point could say, prove it. So you need, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've actually gone through some sort of a process. So I, I think um, in terms of keeping costs down, you probably will need some form of verification. I think the national standards body, there is a framework already set up in, in many countries. Maybe we need to look at doing it somehow on a global basis because this is a global corporate uh, carbon footprint um, concept that we're looking at. Thank you, Maureen. Um, before we come to an end, like with the uh, the discussion, I would like to just bring in a, a, another perspective that, uh, and very interested to also hear your your uh, thoughts on that. Um, and we had this discussion around developing countries uh, this this morning, and. Uh, uh, I don't want to touch up on costs and, and practicality because I think that is an issue which uh, is definitely there. Um, but thinking again of, of the, 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 the larger uh, aspiration that we have in, in bringing down emissions, um, how do you see the relation of uh, uh, like standards in terms of, of quality standards or like uh, production standards that actually uh, require uh, per perhaps certain uh, production methods to bring down emissions in relation to this carbon footprint activity, because there is some relation, um, uh, especially when implemented by by w whatever like labeling standards we have that in other industries with organic labels or uh, wood certification and so on. How do you explore that field? Because there we are also very close to to some of the verification issues. Then uh, again. Um, is there room? How, how would, would these come together? Any th thoughts on that? Actually, that's a question that was also brought in from the, the live stream before. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Klaus, please, yeah, if you want. You know, I, I hesitate a little bit because uh, the experience shows that uh, if you have the same process, it might have significant different emission factors under different circumstances. And uh, even I know from practice, if you take the shipping from agricultural products from New Zealand to the world market, New Zealand told me that there is a factor of 10 between uh, the, uh, which is offered in terms of carbon footprint, how you can manage this shipping. And uh, so uh, I feel all those who want to demonstrate uh, their specific effort, they want that their specific effort is reflected in the carbon footprint of the product. And of course, it's this additional effort that needs to be verified finally in order to get the credibility. And uh, just one, uh, how I always justify the effort that is made in monitoring, reporting, verification is that you have to compare it also with the cost of carbon. Carbon has a social cost linked to the damage it has, and it has a cost on the carbon market. And this cost is quite considerable. A ton 
is in the range now of 10 euros or dollars on the carbon market. This is on the carbon, the carbon price, and the social cost is an order of magnitude higher, even more high, uh, because of the uncertainty. But uh, we have to see also this relationship when we assess what is justified in terms of uh, the costs of verification, also estimation of the carbon footprint. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I think um, perhaps in, there's an element of one angle on your question about the developing countries is, is an element of localism. You know, going back again to, to social responsibility, we wouldn't dream of doing a social audit anywhere now without involving local auditors. Um, and I think it's probably the same sort of question here. You know, you, we will need the, the people in in the countries who understand the local practices, who understand the local constraints, who understand how things are applied in those areas, that will also, I'm sorry to say it, but it will come back to the cost, it will bring the cost down. So. Okay, uh, we are approaching the end. I will try to, to give a brief summary and then I invite uh, you to, to also have some closing remarks that you uh, uh, feel are appropriate. I, I heard that uh, we do uh, envision a, a um, mass market availability of, of, of such information in one way or the other, that uh, more of, of this is actually available uh, to the public. Um, that uh, this, to, to achieve this, um, on the one hand, assurance is needed. At the same time, uh, the, the uh, rules imposed and the requirements set should not be uh, too strict to actually uh, allow for this, th this growth in, in the market. And that probably a role there is for, in, instead of uh, like, uh, uh, assuring results and uh, in this inf all this information, it's much more about setting up the systems behind that actually lead to better assured data. We had the uh, system from France, but I also heard this in terms of um, product category rules in, in, uh, in a systematic way uh, that can actually help us in uh, assuring this kind of mass market availability of, of, of that kind of information. And uh, this also uh, applies to the, the developing country context, as I understand, like there are certain systems actually that can help to, uh, to manage also the, the larger availability and, and cost of this um, kind of uh, information. There is a, uh, a relationship between transparency and uh, assurance. Uh, and uh, I, I took from the discussion that uh, these two go very much hand in hand. Uh, you, when you talk about transparency, you also have to identify very much uh, like where is there actually need for assurance to also uh, have a value in, in transparency that, uh, that may be demanded um, in the market. When we talk about uh, frameworks like product category rules, uh, we have to take into account that these may also have uh, some effects on the kind of data availability uh, that we we have at the same time it's it's also about bringing uh, well the multitude of, of, of standards and also PCRs out there closer together to actually uh, then have a better understanding what kind of, of data do we want to generate in, in, a, in, a, in a consistent way that uh, like having more aligned PCRs could actually help in also providing more of the data that is uh, needed for this kind of um, uh, information. And to, to sum it up, I, I do see still an open question that we will not answer now, but uh, in the sense that uh, uh, verification has a role, but we still have to explore further what actually we want to, to, to assure in the end and what is it that, like what purposes do we, do we aim for and all of these will uh, require different kinds of, of, of assurance probably and uh, it may be wise to have some, some more reflection on that to actually what is the kind of uh, assurance and information that we, we are looking at. Um, I invite you to have quick closing remarks uh, before we, we move on. We have the three minute sign and we want to of course stick to the time also. Please, yes. Okay. So my, my, my conclusion here is that I very often see companies that are considering verification as a burden, a limit, a cost. Um, if, again, the ultimate goal of this uh, product carbon footprint is comparison between products, and I think this is where we are going to. If it is going to be a market competition, competition factor, we need consistency, we need credibility, 
Um, because the same company that today say we don't need verification, when they will see their competitor coming from the same, with the same product, but with a lower value, they will say, oh, we should verify this one. How did he do that? Is it correct? So that's my point. And the final point for me is uh, we have we have identified, I think, here some rooms for improvement. If we look to the, the French, uh, um, the French um, example, for instance, uh, so there are possibilities to, to improve and to uh, leverage the assurance, um, but a lot of work needs to be done. Thank you, Maita. Anyone else? Cynthia? And then. Um, so I'm starting to see like, the, the beginning of a credible um, product carbon footprinting system beginning to develop. I don't know if this is at the top or the bottom of the pyramid, but I see like once the accounting methodology is becomes harmonized um, internationally, um, which we're close to doing. I think based on that, then there'll be, hopefully, programs will, around the world will be adopting these accounting methodologies. And then as they develop PCRs, they'll all agree to have an international system to harmonize those PCRs. And then as companies are doing more product carbon footprinting over time, I expect that more tools will be develop to assist them and more better data will become available as the demand increases. And then um, an assurance system will have to be developed that's a tiered system to meet the, um, to match the needs of the, of the um, information. And then, and then I also see that there's going to be a need for some standardization or a standard for how to actually conduct assurance. And I don't think that is yet available. And then hopefully at the end of that, then there'll be some streamlining of certification systems out there, that there'll be just a few in the marketplace, they're multi-criteria, they're all based on the same, for the carbon piece of it, they're all based on the same methodology. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, we have uh, Roland and then uh, um, close. May I can just invite all of you to, to join uh, us, trying to go together with us, uh, uh, let's say, one step ahead in, in the direction of a, of a new level of, of background databases. We really, I hope I was able to show this in my presentation yesterday, we really try to adapt the structure of our database at the moment in a way that the database can be really used on a global level, that, that we can profit mutually on a global level from this information. Uh, in order to have a consistent, a transparent and a quality insured database that then can be used from decision makers uh, worldwide. Not only for carbon footprinting, I think we really should complete, uh, collect complete inventory data because uh, we need the same kind of information that you use for uh, product carbon footprints you also need in in life cycle assessment studies, in material flow analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you, Roland. We have uh, Klaus and, uh, of course. No, I feel I can be very short. Learning by doing as uh, indicated by Cynthia is really the way forward and I see a lot of value in uh, such initiatives as we learned today morning in ICL Alliance work where, uh, there is the wish to harmonize uh, such verification practices around the world. I feel that's really uh, important because the large uh, supply chains cross continents, they cover a lot of countries and uh, we need this harmonization in order to uh, let it happen really and make it achievable. Okay. Thank you, Klaus. You, you wanted to do a closing remark, or? <laughs> well, if, if there is one remark, I suppose just to be slightly more positive than uh, if I feel that there's not going to be much credit, marketing credit available for reporting something that is going to be a commonplace requirement, I do think there will be marketing credit available for carbon reduction. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that may be where CBs like ourselves also have a role to play in, in helping to promote that sort of um, award, I guess. Okay, well, I would very much like to, to thank uh, the panelists here and also for, for your engagement um, in the discussion. Um, I think they deserved an applause also from, from you for standing up here so long. Thank you.